with a war in the Middle East, a hostage crisis, and sensing weak leadership on the part of CCAN, the communists have determined now is the perfect opportunity to attack. The communists are attempting to expand their influence over their mountainous neighbor to the south. I am Echo 3, and let's continue discussing the Cold War. While the Central Croat Alliance Network continues to develop newer and better equipment, the communists are also doing the same. With the communists now involved in a land war to their south, they are highlighting one of their latest pieces of armor. The goal for this tank is to have a lot of firepower in a small package. This tank is being equipped with the brand new 125mm cannon. The large cannon means large rounds. So, in order to help save space, this tank is also the first to include an autoloader. This has reduced the crew requirement of this tank down to three from the typical four. Also, with the lower crew requirement, the communists will be able to field more of these tanks with the same number of personnel. This tank is being designed for some of the more elite troops of the communist nations. As such, it will be prioritized for upgrades whenever they become available. Most of the armor, especially towards the front, is designed with a slope. That way, any incoming rounds are more likely to be deflected rather than impact directly. The new 105mm gun on Secan Centurion and M60 tanks have forced the communists to reevaluate how they do armor, and instead are now using something called composite armor, layering aluminum in between steel plates should help increase the survivability of the tank and its crew. Skirts are also added around the tracks to help protect them against incoming rounds as well. And to be as environmentally friendly as possible, this tank is powered by solar. Thus, the tank should be able to remain in the field indefinitely, needing only to resupply the crew with ammo and snacks. Inside the hall, Critical pieces are strutted together, and the most important pieces, such as the weapons manager and AI controller, are fitted. Also, in response to CCAN, the communists are developing their first space shuttle. Not to be outdone, the communist version is slightly larger than the Central Kerbin Alliance networks. Also, it is equipped with an extendable docking port, meaning that it has a little bit more range than the Central Credit Alliance Network's version as well. A couple solar panels are fitted inside of the cargo bay. This will keep them protected during ascent and landing. The large vertical stabilizer is nearly identical to the version used by CCAN, also including a split rudder that will help provide extra drag as the craft comes in for a landing. CCAN mounts their large ascent engines directly to the shuttle. The communist version is being optimized for use in a vacuum. Instead, opting to use powerful but vacuum optimized engines on its shuttle. The Cheetah engine weighs only one ton, yet has a vacuum specific impulse of 355 and can gimbal 4 degrees. To aid in maneuverability, the craft is being equipped with these large RCS blocks. One set on the back and another set on the front. This is sufficient to provide full translation and rotation controls. Another advantage to these RCS blocks is that they use the same fuel as the main engines. So there's no need to carry a second fuel type like monoprop. Because the shuttle is slightly larger than the CCAN version, the wing surface area will also need to be slightly larger. Yet for the most part, the two shuttles will look nearly identical. The large wings will provide enough control and lift as the craft descends to the atmosphere that it should be able to land back at the communist space facility, thus making the entire shuttle itself reusable. Here additional lifting surfaces are incorporated into the underside of the craft, and the angle of incidence on the main wing is increased slightly. They will increase its lift and drag. More lifting surfaces are incorporated into the underside of the craft. The yellow and black indicator is the craft's center of mass. The red and black indicator is the center of mass of the craft when the fuel is empty. 
That means that the craft's center of mass moves forward as fuel is used. As long as the pilots and engineers are aware of that, it will not be a big issue. As the shuttle descends to the atmosphere, it will rely less on its RCS blocks and reaction control wheels, and more on its aerodynamic control surfaces. Therefore, these large control surfaces are incorporated into the design. Because they are so large, they will be functional at higher altitudes. Very important will be for the craft to maintain the proper pitch angle as it descends to the atmosphere and attempts to land. So all of the horizontal control surfaces will act as elevators. And even the rudders, when they are deployed, will help the craft pitch up as it comes in for a landing. A slight dihedral angle is given to the main wings. This will help keep the craft more stable in the roll axis. Next, landing gear are incorporated into the shuttle. Since the gear will only be used when the craft comes in for a landing and not for takeoff, they will start off retracted. Also, their layout can be optimized for landing. The rear landing gear can be set far away from the center of mass, and the front landing gear can be set up to be just a little shorter than the rear landing gear, so that the craft will naturally stay nose down as it taxis down the runway. The nose down orientation will help the craft stick the landing a little easier. The exact placement of the Cheetah engines is altered slightly to make sure that the torque readout is as low as possible. Yet the engines are able to gimbal 4 degrees so that they can account for any slight changes in the center of mass. The design of the shuttle is now complete. Now the launch system is being incorporated. Unlike the CK design, this is not an external fuel tank, but instead part of the main rocket that will take this craft into space. In the CK design, a large fuel tank sits on the belly of the shuttle, providing fuel to the main engines located on the shuttle itself. The Communist design will differ significantly from Secan's design in this regard. The fuel tanks, instead, are part of their own rocket that the shuttle is mounted to the side of. And to help provide additional thrust for the first part of the ascent, four boosters will be added to the side of the main rocket. In the future, a way to recover these boosters may be developed. For now, their primary purpose is to get the shuttle into orbit, and recovery of the boosters is not a concern. The boosters themselves seem pretty well developed, and don't appear to need any additional work. But the main rocket looks like it still needs quite a bit of development. As is, the thrust vector is too far off from the center of mass, and the craft will not be able to fly straight at all. A redesign of the main rocket is in order, yet some of the simple tasks, such as adding struts, can still be completed at this time. One issue is that the twin bore only has 4 degrees of gimbal, and that will not be nearly enough to help keep the craft stable. So engineers are looking to use a different engine combination, as well as to angle the tank slightly so that the bottom of the tank will then be more in line with the entire center of mass of the craft. The vector engine is able to gimbal 10 degrees and will be a much better choice for use with this craft. For the initial part of the ascent, the main engines will have their thrust reduced down to just 10%, with the boosters doing most of the work. This will also help keep the thrust more in line with the center of mass. Once the side boosters are decoupled, the main engines will then throttle up the rest of the way. The angle of the engines is carefully considered to help keep the thrust vector as in line with the center of mass as much as possible. While the vector engines can gimbal 10 degrees, if the center of mass goes further outside of the thrust vector more than 10 degrees, then the craft will lose all control. Trying to mount a shuttle on top of a rocket can make the thrust vectoring issue a whole lot easier. The downside to that is trying to deal with all of the aerodynamic forces by having large wings on the front of the craft. That can be compensated for by having even larger wings on the booster stage. So there are different workable solutions for designing shuttles, but they all have their own complexity issues. As is, this communist design is fully capable of taking a crew to Mun orbit and back to Kerbin. A Cal-1000 is used to help control the thrust on the main engines. Therefore, their thrust 
can be controlled independently of the main throttle. And liftoff of Snowstorm. For this very first flight, the communists have elected not to include any crew. Instead, relying entirely on the automated control of the probe core. With the side boosters decoupled, the thrust on the main engines is adjusted independently, helping keep the craft stable. The main engines now have accelerated the craft to almost orbital velocity and an altitude over 200,000 meters. As is, the craft has enough delta V to fly to the MUN and back. However, for this first test flight, it will merely orbit Kerbin and return back to the launch site. If the shuttle is ever not able to land back at the launch facility, it would need something like the world's largest airplane to carry it back. The largest lift capacity of any aircraft in the entire world ever? Communist engineers say, don't worry about it. They're already on it. If the Central Kerbin Alliance Network can develop something, so can the communist. And the communist can make it even bigger. With the deorbit burn complete, the shuttle reorients itself for re-entry and landing. CCAN has an east-west facing runway along the equator. That greatly simplifies their re-entry and landing procedures. The communists, on the other hand, have a north-south facing runway quite a few degrees away from the equator. But using the shuttle's advanced aerodynamics, this will not be an issue. Coming from the west, the shuttle approaches a position north of the runway and then makes a 90 degree turn to line up. The runway really isn't long enough for this. Fortunately, the terrain is pretty flat. Controllers then are able to turn the shuttle around and bring it easily back to the runway. With that, the first test flight has been a success. The communist southern war is struggling. Communist forces have easily taken control of the urban areas and the capital but the more rural areas are proving to be more difficult. Hopefully for the communists, this war doesn't turn out to be a quagmire like the Seacans war in Southeast Kerbin. In this difficult terrain, helicopters have proven to be very useful, but new technologies have made them also more vulnerable. Seacan appears weak, and the communists have become more aggressive. I am Echo 3. And thanks for joining me on this discussion about the Cold War. I will see you next time.